questions as witness, please come forward if there are. You can push a little button there. State your name and address. Spell your last name. Roger Nelson. Go ahead. This is a question as your standing as an expert by the board. Do you consider any of your testimony to be anecdotal or scientific? Uh, this board did not find me as an expert witness, so therefore they cut me off at 15 minutes, 10 minutes. So, um, you had scientific information you were going to present, and the board deleted you from the ability to do that. Uh, scientific information? I was simply um, providing what details and facts that happened in my family. Which is at the door. Mr. Nelson, I'm sorry, when you ask questions, can you move me into the microphone? That way, it's okay, that way everybody can get yes, a room I, I apologize. No, that's all right. No, well, it's working. This is brand new to me. That's okay. Okay. Yeah, sure. okay. Did you not also testify under oath that you were an open book, ask me anything? Oh, yes, and I've answered all and the questions. And one minute before that, somebody asked you about specific scientific information which you brought out that you have and you refused to disclose it? Are you talking about uh, the accusation? Yes. Medical information? No, or the there? accusation is going in. You, you oh. said that you couldn't do that. You could have brought a waiver with you. Um, at this time, I, I am and since I have potential litigation that would uh, be ongoing, I'm unwilling to share the, the minute details of exact measurements or my doctor reports at my house. And that litigation wouldn't involve any amount of money? I don't understand. Well, I mean, everybody's saying how horrible it is that this is all about the money. Do you, uh, do you have a money motive here? Um, my wife and I have discussed about what would be the good of the outcome of the lawsuit. Our goal from the lawsuit, first off, when we're still living in our house, was to simply have the wind turbines torn down. That's, that's what the goal of our lawsuit would have been. It would not have been a payment. It would have just been us being able to be allowed to sleep in our house. That's what we wanted. Um, if not tearing down the wind turbines, I think we would have agreed to let them run in the daytime, but definitely not at night when we were trying to sleep. That, that was our goal. We wanted to be left alone and stay in our home. That was our first choice, to stay where we were. And the second choice was? Um, as you testified to. Our second choice to stay in our house, which in energy was not um, cooperating or allowing us to have sleep at night, we had very limited choices, um, so we we moved to a temporary home. That was our, our choice. Um, some people um, can't afford to move or live elsewhere and still have the house payment and such, but fortunately we were able to figure out how we could live in a temporary situation until we could afford another house. Did you testify earlier that if the energy had bought your house, you'd have willingly signed a gag order and never brought oh, any of this forward? If if energy would have, um, we, we requested as a solution to our problem, we requested the energy to purchase our home, and they re flat out refused to purchase our house. I think their answer was, we don't buy residential real estate, and that was their dead pain answer. It was a non-starter for inventory. But it was a clear option for you. Um, we would have negotiated and we would have taken, um, to, to be relieved of our home and the financial burden, we would have sold our house to Invenergy. And, and signed a gag order and never done any of this, as I understood your testimony. I misunderstood. Um, 
you did not misunderstand. I think if they would have purchased our home and they would have bought it, and I would have accepted that and we would have moved out, we would have definitely moved on with our lives and I would not be um, still angry about it enough to, um, like Jim said, travel across the country to testify against Invenergy. And Invenergy did my family wrong. And even though my house was ruined, I am not letting it be wasted. No further questions here. Thank you. Mr. Williams, uh, before you start to cross-examine Mr. Harkey, and this is this is a, a, a general notice to everyone, not, not just you, um, we have to limit cross-examination to new questions. We can't have cumulative questions. Um, for example, you can't ask Mr. Harkey and your name Ted Harkey every time. If you have a new question, if you have a different question, we encourage you to come up and ask those questions of Mr. Harkey. Uh, but if you've heard someone else ask about the issue that you previously, or the issue that you want to touch upon, we're going to have to move beyond that. Um, that way we're not, uh, Mr. Harkey doesn't spend the rest of the evening in the hot seat, so to speak. Everybody understand? Yep. Okay. Amy Winterland. 22825 North 3075 East Road, Colfax, Illinois 61728. So, um, <clears throat> you were talking about Cal Ridge. Is that this California Ridge Wind Energy LLC? Yes. So, um, and, and there was some testimony that the Cal Ridge, I think, uh, somebody named Mulvaney said it was a huge boom. Um, from a school perspective, was a huge success and would keep them alive for 10 years. That was what was that testified. was um, an article that the Invenergy attorney handed out tonight. Were you aware that there's an October 12, 2016 article that says Invenergy Terraform Powers Wind Farm California Ridge Wind Energy LLC owes the most outstanding property tax bill in all of Champaign County in the amount of $480,298. Yes, I remember that article uh, specifically. So would outstanding property tax bills result in a huge boon to the economic welfare of that county? No. In your opinion? This is friendly cross-examination. Just ask questions. Well, and it's hearsay as evidence, you know, so uh, ask a question. It's a, new, it's a published newspaper article. I can provide a reference. Is that what you mean? You can ask a cross-examination on things that he's, he's already testified to. If you have the article that's available for everyone to review, that's fine. Um, but you have to ask him questions about what he's already testified to. I understand he's testified about Mr. McElmaney and, and those sorts of things. But, but ongoing um, articles are beyond the scope of what he's previously testified to because that was brought up in someone else's cross-examination. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, so keep me straight. I am very interested in the noise part of this. Okay. So my next questions are gonna be about the noise part of this. So um, did I understand you to say that the maximum decibels was 46 decibels that it was recommended by the Schomer study? Uh, the maximum decibels at my house were measured in the magnitude of about 45 and a half to 46 and a half decibels at DVA. Um, Dr. Schomer states in his uh, analysis that um, the noise maximum should be at or less than 39 decibels. Do you know if there was a noise study, a model study done of your house prior to the turbines being built? There was. Do you know what your model number, what, what your house was modeled to be? Um, I've, I've never thought to go look at the original noise levels in the original noise model. I believe that it's very basic. It's, it's just some contour lines 
and there's a, a huge jump from 40 dBA to 45 dBA. It's it's not very uh, forthcoming with information. It's it's really a bare bones contour map for how loud turbines will be. But 39 dBA is the recommended maximum. It's not the Illinois Pollution Control's maximum, but it's the recommended annoyance maximum. Am I understanding? Am I am I confused? I'm sorry. It was. Um, my testimony included information from Dr. Schomer, who did the noise analysis at my home, and his subsequent publications all say design for a noise limit of 34 dBA, so the maximum 95% of the time is at or below 39 dBA. That, in a nutshell, is Dr. Schomer's uh, summary of his submittals. Were you aware that in, in Benergy's application, they're using a, I believe it's a 47 dBA dB at 500 hertz as a maximum, and the models come in at like 46.8? Ms. Winderland, you're testifying. So you have to ask a question. Were you aware of that? Um, that's that's not a question. Okay, sir. During my, uh, I looked at the um, inventor's application for McLean County, and I saw a big, huge list of all the homes listed, and um, I think it had the uh, receiver house number, and it had a maximum noise level, and many of them are. Uh, at the same or maybe a slightly higher noise level than what the actual measurements at my house were. And can you tell us again what, what sound bothered you the most? Um, the sound that bothered us the most was uh, a rumbling, thumping noise like heavy bass. Um, to describe it, it's like um, if someone comes to your home and you're expecting guests and you're cleaning and you're furiously getting ready and you hear a car door slam and you say, oh crap, I gotta get clothes on, <laughs> that sudden jolt and kind of like a, uh, an awakening or peaking your senses, that feeling of something just happened and I need to do something, that's kind of like a reaction. That's the type of noise that would happen because the with the wind, the, the turbines would speed up or slow down or have a gust of wind and we would get these pulsating like a, I would consider it like a rumble or a thump, like a, someone opening the door of your house suddenly or uh, your kid falling out of bed. That's the type of feeling and the type of noise that was bothering us the most. It was just, it's just the, the bump in the night, thumping rumble noise that you cannot insulate against or get away from. So do you think, so so you're only, um, so do you think setting back turbines farther would help with that? Uh, most definitely. Uh, larger setbacks would help all of the noise issues. I have only one other question. It's um, not related to noise, but do you know what the distance setback for the Mackinac River is? A half mile. I was here when that was being discussed. Is that off topic? It's beyond the scope of what he's testified to. And he's now testifying to things he heard in a prior hearing. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's the only information I have. Okay. Um, no further questions. Anyone else in the audience have questions? Come forward. I think you know the process. Julie Hall Cotter, 23571 North 2900 East Road, Lexington. I have pretty much yes and no questions, so. When you mentioned they wanted to insulate your home, was your home not already insulated? Uh, it, it's already insulated. 
so they wanted to put additional yeah. insulation or redo it completely? I think the plan was to remove and replace or just add add more, pack it in as much as they could fit in the wall. Okay. When you did sell your home, did you sell your home at a profit or a loss? That's kind of a trick question because um, I bought my home out of a foreclosure. My house didn't look anything like it did in the photos I shared here. It didn't have a garage or a breezeway addition and it was it was a foreclosure home. It was a real mess. So, um, hey, you still do that yes or no because you know how much you pay for your house and what you got. So, yes or no. I perhaps I, I probably lost um, financially. Can I include the time I wasn't able to live in the house I and mean, the expenses of not? This is a yes or no answer. Considering what you had put into your home and what you would have gotten out of it were you to sell it if there were no land farm around? Um, I'm going to say if, if there had been no wind farm there, uh, I'd be, uh, we probably lost $100,000. If, if someone held a gun to my head and said, Mr. Harkey, how much exactly is it? And I didn't have time to go through all the details. It's in the magnitude of $100,000. Okay. And you spoke at a community meeting in Lexington on January 17th. Yes. Is it true that when we offered you even a bottle of water for the ride that you did not want to be accused of taking any compensation? Ms. Kai, uh, this is referred to, hold on just a second, this is referred to as friendly cross-examination. Mm -hmm. You're bolstering uh, his okay. testimony. So, you, so the cross-examination is an opportunity to challenge or, or test the veracity of what someone is testifying to, okay? The veracity of me not making taking any payment, I have not ever taken payment. And I'm not challenging that. I just want to make sure we maintain the yeah. same pro uh, process throughout the hearing. <laughs> like, for instance, not even bottle of water. This bottle of water was Mr. provided. Harvey. I was speaking to Mr. Harvey. Okay. Um, I believe it was Michael Hankard you said did in Energy's studies? Yes, Hankard and oh. Dr. Schoenberg were both involved in the noise study for in Energy. Did you have an opportunity to even speak to them when they came to your home to do your study? Um, on the first day of the study, um, I met Michael Hankard, and that's the only time I've ever seen him. Did you speak with him? Yes. Could you share the conversation? Um, Is that allowed? Or? In my testimony, I have a... Uh, Hold on just a second. This is in my testimony. It's, unless he's here, it's just hearsay to us. Because you know, you can, you can say he said anything, and you know, not that I don't believe you, but we can't use him, so it doesn't really matter. It doesn't matter what he told me. Okay, I have no other questions. Shields. You need the address also. Uh, 701 Broadway, normal, normally. <coughs> Can you spell shield for that? Sure. S H I E L D S. Thanks. Just a couple of curiosity questions. Um, I uh, seem like a great guy. I also seem angry. Kind of, kind of you a little closer to the mic. You just seem like a great guy who's angry and kind of a man on a mission here. Um, at what point, under what set of circumstances will your mission be complete? Um, if I think that Invenergy will stop um, taking away people's ability to sleep in their home, and doing the same thing that they did to us when when that repeat scenario um, goes away, I will go away, and I I'll live on my life for 
and not just in energy, it's um, uh, Eon or Apex, it doesn't matter. As soon as there's a realization that, uh, or an admission, or they stop harming families like what happened to mine, then I will stop. Is there a set of evidence that could uh, affirm that for you? A set of evidence that would affirm that they would quit causing problems for people? Yeah, I think the, the moment in time that all of these wind turbine setbacks are based on noise in relationship to the distance, as soon as those safe distances are, are put in place, for non-participants, uh, that's when I'll stop. I am totally in agreement with allowing any wind company to negotiate those noise easements or you know, possible effects that might happen to neighbors, as long as those neighbors even have that opportunity. But for as long as it's shortchanged by a, a ZBA or a county board and they're an intermediary who, who um, this allows those residents to represent themselves and negotiate directly with the wind company. Um, I think that's theft. Um, taking away people's ability to protect their homes by not being able to um, purchase an easement or sell an easement and, and protect all of their property because they own all of it um, as soon as individuals are allowed to represent themselves to do that with wind companies, I don't think at any time Invenergy should ever be allowed to build turbines within the distances that they were from my house. Um, you know, I, I testified twice and I, I admitted this once that if Invenergy would have I, I, I built in 3,200 feet away, and I only lost two nights of sleep and half of a year. I, I would be okay with that. I really would be, but I think you've got one more question for it. Yeah. Okay. Um, I had not lived near a wind turbine, but I lived in towns and uh, fire trucks go by at night, mm -hmm. ambulances go by at night, trains go by frequently. Compare the noise level of a wind turbine to a fire truck or an ambulance going right by your house? Um, you, the ambulance and the fire truck are, are much, much noisier going by your house. The trouble and the, the root cause of the problem that we have is, is that in the ambulance or fire truck situation, uh, that's an emergency. And that's, it, happened, it goes by and in one or two minutes it's over with and you go back to sleep or go back to what you're doing. In the case of a wind turbine, it grinds on you and wears you down. It's, um, it's, it's instead of... Or a train uh, that's on a regular schedule. Or, or a train that's uh, here and gone in five minutes or 10 minutes even. Every hour, at least you still have 55 minutes of that hour to sleep or relax, whereas the wind turbine was grinding on and on and, and wear, it just wears us down. It's like, Okay, um, carpal tunnel disease. Thanks. Okay. Uh, anyone else have questions? Uh, one more. Spell your last name. David Kaufman, K A U F M A N, 549 County Road, 2500 East, El Paso, Illinois. I got a, I got a question. I looked at your area of your where your house is sitting. Being a landowner, I am. Being out in the country, and I do live in the country. What, what, if I own land right next to you, what would stop me from putting a bin site up there, whether I got, where I've got uh, dryers going all night, 
for four nights a year, fans one six months a year, or cattle, or hogs. And you, the Santa Wind Turbine, you, you I got a chance turbine. to answer the question. Just oh, kind of, okay. are you guys yeah, okay, that one there? Just yeah. kind of give them a chance. Yeah, this well, is a solid question, I'll be glad to answer yeah. it. My council says that's beyond the scope of what we talked about, so, mm -hmm. so I'm not sure she'll, she'll answer it. She's well, my back, so. <laughs> that's because my presentation is cut short. I grew up on a hog farm. I can easily yeah, answer that for me. <laughs> Mr. Kaufman, um, when I say it's outside the scope, you have to limit your question to what Mr. Harkin testified to. Okay, so he testified to things that happened on his property and that sort of thing. Well, that's what I was pointing out is his property out in the country. You can ask him about what surrounds his property, but you can't. You, um, you, he only testified to what occurred on his property or nearby, if that makes sense. Okay. So to ask him what would prevent you from doing something else is beyond the scope of what he testified to, but you can ask him about the, the, the condition or, or where his property is situated or what surrounds his property. Okay, when you moved to the country and bought the house, there was um, repossessed, whatever, I don't remember what you said. <laughs> Were you even aware at the time that there's going to be windows coming? No, when we purchased our home, it was way before the county even had a wind farm ordinance. Uh, there was no thought or knowledge for anyone, probably on earth, that thought there was a wind farm coming from when I purchased my home. When you moved out to the country, did you ever think anything could happen? Oh yeah, uh, we live in the country and uh, Vermillion County has no zoning, so therefore, to answer your question earlier, they could put a bin immediately on the property line. They could put a hog farm. I think the limit is 1,500 feet from your home because of the only CAFO laws. And uh, I grew up on a hog farm. I had no problems dealing with any agricultural use on my neighbor's property, whether it be hog barns or bins, because I lived within 200 feet of one for 18 years. Um, my fam I'm the only engineer surveyor in my family, and most of the rest of them are all farmers. So I, I understand your urge to be able to do whatever you want on your land, but today I'm testifying about how what you did came inside my home, in my bedrooms, in my beds of my children. That's where Invergy crossed the line. But did you testify that you wouldn't let Invergy in, but you let someone else in to do the, do the measurement in your house? I did, and the, and the type of noise measurements that we did in our home was not recording the conversation audible levels inside of our home. Couldn't and Invergy do the same thing? And energy um, wanted to record all of the noise at or inside my home. But couldn't it have done it done to your request and not recorded on it? I mean, if somebody else could do it, um, why couldn't? It? Okay, our negotiations with Invenergy about the limitations of what we would or would not allow it lasted one letter, and they they demanded to have access to our house within one week of them starting their sound study. We replied back with their contract that was like a whole harmless agreement and they had a bunch of stuff in it. We were not in agreement with the terms that they provided to us. And when we suggested uh, otherwise, and we also suggested to have Dr. Shomer involved with the wind, the, the noise study, and energy quickly declared that the Harkies are unreasonable, they're refusing to cooperate, they're the bad guys, and they and they Is that your say from you, or is that... No, that's what happened. <laughs> Within one week of them demanding access to my home, they had, um, I think it was within one week, they had instruments set up on my property line. So we had no time to react to their request, except to say... But if somebody, if you was complaining, wouldn't you want somebody, if you couldn't sleep at night, wouldn't you want somebody there right away? We, um... Or we, wait several months. We begged for them to come record the noise, measure the noise. But they did. Uh, they did it, and they started about nine months after we started complaining. We, we wanted any help we could get. You know, all the way until May, we were... Didn't you say they, did, they were going to be there the next week, and you wouldn't let them? 
Well, it was if you was to read the the terms of the agreement. I'm, I'm not access. saying I'm going to read them, but it's just that they wanted what full, you said. They wanted full access to my entire home in, in their uh, request. I mean, it was like a demand letter. Uh, we're going to come into your home and record everything. But and isn't isn't the noise complaint in your house? Wasn't your daughter in your house with the earmuffs on? Why wouldn't you measure it in the house instead of outside? Mr. Hoffman. Uh, oh, well, okay. Okay. So, no, I just I think Mr. Hartke's already answered that question for you. It, it was uh, simply for the uh, protection of our privacy okay. and the terms of their offer. They were, they were, um, I, I don't want to say the word crazy. They were um, to totally um, to, in, in energy's advantage, to pour it in into my home that I, I wasn't, oh, I was going to negotiate some different kind of arrangement to have noise measured inside my home, but they immediately went to uh, declaring that I was uncooperative. After they said they'd be there within a week, and you said no. If you have a problem... Oh, they did not, okay. Uh, there's a, you know, the right there's a, a specific item. So they sent a letter to my attorney we wrote back, hey, these terms aren't very good for us, and we'd like to talk about items, whatever. And I'm paraphrasing. And they showed up unannounced without telling us, hey, we have a week, we have a deadline, nothing. They, they immediately showed up on their own without telling us uh, when to expect them. There was, they didn't give us a deadline. They just showed up and did their thing and declared that we were uncooperative. But you wanted them to do it right away so you could sleep at night, right? Well, we wanted them to be able to sleep at night, but having the noise measurements were not going to change our ability to sleep in our, our beds. They were just going to sit there and record, and we're supposed to go about our business. I, I think we've kind of covered all this already. I wish you got something else. Okay. Thanks for coming up. It was a very difficult situation. It's all. Uh, any more questions? Push your button, I think you're done. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ryan Worldly, uh, 503 Mulberry. Mr. Worthley, did you want to testify? Jake, Jake, Bolte, uh, on Locust Street. Frank Corey, 17, Clinton Place. Mr. Gonzalez, 410 East Washington Street. John Slagle.
Lane. That's M I R L Y N B E T H in Fairbury, Illinois. For, for the record, we would label the uh, PowerPoint as SLG Exhibit 18. What's SLG stand for? Shroud, Luke, Hans, and Garner, my law firm. That's based on conversations I had with, with Samantha yesterday. Find one there. Clicking is able to open as administrator or something. I don't know. I have my laptop, I can view it on those. I believe all the board members have it, so if it doesn't work, um, we, it's, always, it's something that we can, you can always email to us and we can go through it. Okay, um, you can copy the PDF. Let's see, do you have internet on there? I send you a Dropbox link. Dropbox link. Okay, Mr. Lukenhaus, Hans, I do have some questions about um, Mr. Slagle's um, qualifications. Do you mind if I go ahead and ask the questions, or would you like to lay the foundation? No, you can go ahead. Okay. Um, Mr. Schlegel, I'm going to... Mr. Schlegel, I'm going to... Some of these are going to be yes or no questions just based on what's in your PowerPoint. Um, so my understanding is that you have a Bachelor's of Science in Computer Science from U of I, uh, obtained in 1993. Correct. Okay. Um, you are a member of the Acoustical Society of America. Correct. Okay. And uh, the Bachelor's of Science at your highest degree of education? Correct. Okay. And uh, it indicates that you are a professional computer programmer for the last 25 years? Yep. 25 years to current? Yep. Okay. And it indicates that you now own, and I think it's supposed to say manage, an engineering and manufacturing company based in Fairbury. That's correct. Okay. Um, what's the name of the company? Uh, Emotion LLC, a dash between the E and Emotion. And what is your position there? Uh, I'm the president, acting man, acting partner, okay. managing partner. Okay. Now it says here that the company itself makes electronics, but what do you do for the company? Uh, well, I program for it. Uh, I'm a programmer, uh, but then I also run the company. Okay. So you do ground floor stuff as well as administrative. Yes. Okay. Exactly. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> is your bachelor of science is that the only degree that you hold? Yes. Um, have you lectured um, uh, no. previously? Okay. Have you testified previously? I have testified about this same sound stuff that I'm going to testify about today in Livingston County. In Livingston County? Yes. Do you recall when that was? Uh, 2000, uh, 2015, I believe. Is that the only other time that you can recall? Yes, yes. Right. So you said no lectures. Um, is the Acoustical Society of America, is that your only professional association? Yeah, that has to do with this, yes. Okay. And how long have you held um, membership with that society? Since 2015. Okay. Any honors, awards, or awards um, in your field? No. Okay. Um, other than your your bachelor's of science in uh, computer science, do you have any specialization or certification within your field? No. Okay. Uh, what specific training beyond your bachelor's do you have in your area of speciality? Well, in, in terms of this, in terms of the sound stuff, I would say. In terms of, well, and we'll get to your, what you want to be qualified as. Yeah. Um, it says you're a professional computer programmer. Um, what what, spe what special training um, have you, or specific training have you received in that regard? Basically what I learned in school and on the job. So. Okay. Um, do you have any publications or research? No. Do you possess any professional licensing? No. 
Uh, can you list your places of employment prior to um, owning or working for Emotion LLC? Yes, it's none of that is really pertinent to sound stuff except for my game programming experience. Okay. Um, Tell us about that. Basically, from 1993 until 2006, I made computer games in Champaign, Illinois. Um, we was started. That, was uh, that a particular company? Yes. What was the company? It started out called Parallax Software, and it ended up being uh, a studio called Volition, which got out, bought out by a company called THQ. Um, that's what it ended up. And you, you've made uh, video games for them? Yes. All right. Um, can you state your duties or your responsibilities at your previous position? At the game stuff? Yeah, yeah basically I, I was an engine programmer, um, which means we did a lot of the graphics and physics and sound uh, to make 3D games. They have a lot of sound in them, uh, you know, bullets, ricocheting, uh, explosions, they all get mixed together in real time, trade with distance and things like that. Um, what type, if any, of scientific or technical studies have you conducted? Uh, none. Okay. Has, well, no, go ahead. Uh, I guess, um, you know, no, none. Let's go. Has any of your work been peer reviewed? No. Did you prepare a report for this, uh, the hearing today? Yes, I did. Okay. Is that contained in here? Yep. Okay, can you tell me what page? Oh, uh, the report, I would basically, the summary of the data that I'm presenting is starting on pages uh, 16. Okay. Um,
do you believe that your testimony will be helpful in assisting the board uh, in making uh, understanding the facts of this case and coming to a determination? I think so. Okay. Um, now, I want to make sure I understand um, what in particular are you asking to be qualified as an expert in? Uh, programming. Because basically, I took the ISO 9613 specs and put it into a program, um, took the data from the applicant's um, sound study and implemented the programming and produced graphs. So I would say making graphs uh, and programs out of their data. Okay, are you asking to be determined an expert for the purpose of um, explaining or describing the results between moving the data from program to program? Yes, and then, yes, and presenting the results in a way that people can understand. Okay, so in an, it, said in another way, you're asking to be qualified as an expert in noise prediction? I wouldn't say so. The ISO spec is pretty much done by experts. I just implemented it following what they did. Okay, so you replicated what acquisitions did? Yes. Okay. Well, I implemented their <coughs> steps that they outlined. In order, basically, they say in order to do this calculation, you follow these steps. So okay. I implemented it. Mr. Slagle, um, based on, on what I understand you're going to testify to, um, I certainly believe that you have experience and, and credentialing, considerable um, credentialing with regard to computer programming. Um, and to that regard, if you want to testify to that, I think that's perfectly appropriate. Um, but with regard to what data means, pulling it out of one program into what an a model that an acquisition would use and what, um, what that means to uh, interpret it for the board, I think is beyond your expertise being qualified as an expert. So you can do one of two things, and then you can confirm with Mr. Luke and Hans before you testify. If you're going to limit your testimony to um, computer print, computer programming only, you would be an expert, um, and you would have to make it relevant for 30 minutes or less. Um, if you want to testify about something less than uh, something about uh, prediction or um, interpretation or that sort of thing, I don't believe that you would need the qualifications to be an expert. Okay. Well, can, I, can I ask a question because I'm a little confused? Sure. Um, he's not going to say what anything, he's not, he's just going to show what the model predicts where. That's all he's doing. He is running a model and showing you exactly what it predicts at what point. It is a computer programming. He's not going to give opinions as to whether a certain decibel is inappropriate. He's going to just give you, here is what the model shows at these locations. So that, my question is, is he able to do that? Because that's really nothing more than a programming, and that's really all that is. He is running the program. What, what I can tell you is based on what Mr. Slagle has testified to, and I believe he's been very honest and forthright with me, um, I don't believe he meets the, the threshold to be a, um, a expert with regard to what the data means. Um, I think he can testify absolutely to the steps that he took. Um, and I plugged A into B and then B will C, um, but when we get into we have X amount of hertz or this, this, um, um, uh, this particular wind turbine will present this much or, or, or something of that nature, I think that's beyond his expertise. Um, like I said, I, I want to afford him every opportunity given his expertise, but I do not believe that he rises to the level of interpretation such as an acquisition might. He's not actually, but here's the difference. He's not interpreting. He is running the model, and all he is doing is telling you what the model ended up at. That is nothing more than a computer programming issue. It is not an acoustician. It is run the model, here's where it is, here's what happens. And that's what he's going to testify to, and he does not need to be published as an acoustician to do that. He has, under the federal rule of evidence, which is Specialized knowledge which will assist the trier of fact to understand the evidence or to determine a fact and issue. A witness qualified as an expert by knowledge, skill, experience, training, or education may testify thereto in the form of an opinion or otherwise. He meets Rule 702 of the Federal Rules of Evidence, and this board should not even go to that standard. I, I understand. 
understand your position, Mr. Lucan Hans. I've, I've discussed it with uh, board, the board, and the board is of the opinion that he is not uh, an expert in that regard. Um, so he, it, it, it's up to you. You can confer, you can confer with Mr. Slagle. Um, he can do the 10 minutes, or he can do the 30 minutes, but it will have to be confined in that manner. So if he does the 10 minutes, he can go beyond. If he does the 30, he cannot go beyond what he did. Is that what you're saying? I'm what just I, trying to understand what the, the rules are here. No, I understand. What I'm telling you is is that, um, similar to a court of law, um, experts are afforded um, a, a weight. Um, there is a weight and credibility issue with experts. That, that's why we look into their background, we look into their credentialing and that sort of thing. That's not to say that I'm going to limit what he can talk about. I'm saying that the weight and credibility of what he testifies to is different. And I believe that as a, as a member of the bar, I believe you understand that. Um, I, I am not saying that he is inexperienced or anything of that nature. I am simply indicating that he does not meet the threshold to be a, an expert with regard to the excuse me, the interpretation. I, like I said, I, I and, and I guess that's where we're having this problem because I'm not asking him to interpret anything. I'm asking him to run the model and to provide the results. That it's nothing more than a computer program. That is what he's been asked to do. He's not asked to come up with with the solution. He's not asked to say that 41.4 is inappropriate. He's just going to give you what the computer runs. I think This time of night, I can handle 10 minutes. I mean, <laughs> you've covered my first three slides. I mean, if you can do it in, in 10 minutes, have at it. 30. 30. Sounds good. Okay. 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 Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Lead into it? Yep. Okay. Um, so, Basically, I've been studying wind developer applications that, like you guys have in front of you since 2014. Someone mentioned this tonight. I'm also not, I wasn't satisfied with the limited view that the wind companies give you. They give you very little data. Um, oh, thank you. Appreciate that. Um, they give you very little data. Um, they don't give you uh, clear data. They, you can't always tell which homes represent what sound data. You can't really reanalyze it. You know, they give you just enough to support their conclusion. You can't go through it. So, so I wasn't satisfied with that. So I thought, is there, you know, can, can someone else validate this? I looked around, and it's expensive to hire a sound engineering company to go out and do these sound studies. Um, it takes time. So the minute you get an application in and there's a CBA hearing, you do not have the time between there to handle it, or most people don't have the money to hire someone to do it. So basically, I'm a programmer. I saw these wind companies are using ISO 9613, so I implemented it myself. Um, basically, it's not a complicated algorithm. It's very simple. It didn't take me long to write. Uh, the hard part is really getting the data, marking all the houses, uh, marking the turbines, uh, pulling them in from the recording system used in the application, that sort of thing. Uh, fig figuring out where to show the data, and, you know, a good view of the data and things like that. So basically, you know, what I do is I put the numbers in that they give in the application. I make sure my data matches their data, so we're all calculating the same numbers. But once I can match the limited data they gave me, then I then I can go back and create any other data. I can create contour maps. I can look at particular houses. I can change scenarios. I can say, what if this was a little farther away? In terms of that. So that's basically what I did. Um, basically, the ISO 9613. Um, this is on page five. Turn the page. Um, so basically ISO 9613 is, I don't know if you remember when you were a kid and lightning and thunder come out, you basically count seconds between lightning and thunder, divide by five, that's how many miles away it is. Uh, obviously the real physics behind that is way more complicated than that, so it's a rough approximation, but it, it's good, you know, and that's what ISO 9613 is. It's, it takes very complicated things, sounds reflecting off the ground, going through materials, and it simplifies it down into a set of equations. If you really wanted to, you could solve an Excel in a spreadsheet. The hard part of doing that would be when you have 120 sound sources and 500 homes, the n squared complication there, it's a huge number. So a computer just chugs right through it. Um, so the other thing about ISO 9613 is they get very good limits on it in, in the documents for it. You know, um, they say the delta height, they recommend a 30 meter max between the 
uh, listener and the sound editor. This is ob wind farms are obviously over that. Um, they recommend a max of um, up to a thousand meters. Wind farms go beyond that. But generally, as the California Ridge Project shows, the um, ISO 9613 it, it does a decent job predicting. You know, you plug these numbers in, you get a decent prediction. People have been using it. It seems to work, um, as validated by the California Ridge Project. Um, so, Mr. Slager, I'm sorry to interrupt, but this, this testimony is not about computer programming. It's about Mr. Slagle uh, purporting to be an acoustician or a professional engineer, and he is not. So, uh, he, he's not claiming that he's a party that's, that has standing here to testify. So, basically, he's, he's, in, he's in a person who doesn't have standing to come in here and testify, or at least he hasn't explained that. And so he's a, he's a non-expert who's been presented as an expert to talk about a subject matter he's not been determined to be an expert on. So I, I don't know what the purpose of his testimony is. I, I understand your position, Mr. Griffin, but I think that was the, that was the point of the exchange between you and Mr. Lukenhans. Um, that's why I indicated to Mr. Lukenhans that Mr. Slagle is, um, will not be considered an expert. So his testimony is, he's given a, a, a more brief period of time. and. By the way, I understood Mr. Slagle's testimony when I was questioning him. Um, his indication was that he is a computer programmer. He simply followed the, the, the steps to complete the matrix as he understood it and that he is reporting on it now. So um, uh, you certainly will have your opportunity to cross-examine Mr. Slagle um, um, if, if you feel that it's necessary. But that was the, the purpose of the exchange between uh, Mr. Slagle and Mr. Lutheran and I. And, and for the record, standing is I brought him in here and I have standing with 52 residents. Okay, thank you. Um, so basically, the applicant's sound study here in the application, they, they say they use ISO 9613, they give all their parameters. Um, I plugged all their numbers into my thing, came out, matched their numbers, I agreed with what they, uh, with the numbers they generated, they fit the data, they didn't fudge the numbers in any way, so that's good. Um, so the one thing I did want to relate here is um, on the, the uh, real world example of how the Modeling the ISO 9613 for predictions relates to what you actually see in real life. Um, so to do this, you sort of you need a prediction, and then you need the what happened in real life. And what we have is thanks to California Ridge Noise um, Compliance Analysis, page nine now. I'm looking through this. Um, basically, the analysis was done because of complaints of two residents, Harkey being one of them that you saw tonight. Um, they came to prove that they meet the IPCD legal limits. Um, and before that, they had done a sound study prediction model in their application, so it's perfectly what we need. So the key thing here is the page, page 10, which for some reason the page number's not on there, but this graph here. This graph is beautiful in terms of understanding how the prediction relates to what was actually measured. So in the case of Hart, he's a, not Hart, in the case of this project, um, for the sound um, data point where they measured, where they sent their microphones and they, and they measured the sound over the course of the study, um, that, according, you know, I did the model using their turbines and stuff, and according to the data model in the 1000 hertz band, um, the prediction there would be 39.8. This jives exactly with what Energy said. They said none of our predicted models in, in this 1000 hertz range for this project were over 40 decibels. So it, it, it's, Basically, that's the predicted value there. Um, so if you look at this graph, you see the green horizontal line? That's the predicted value there, 39.8 decibels in the 1,000 hertz octave band. The x-axis, the horizontal axis, is the wind speed that they measured at the time they took each of these average readings, hourly readings. The um, vertical axis is the octave that they, is the sound decibel that they measured at that time. So now, the, if you look at this, now I'm referring to the, um, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, go back to the graph, I would say. If, if you look at the graph, so they predicted the green horizontal line. When they go out and measure, they got data above it and below it. it. Wasn't perfectly on that line, as you would expect. Some is above, some is below. What they did for this, the purpose of the sound study, the compliance report, is they said anything below five meters per second wind speed. Um, doesn't, if there's too much wind noise in it, we're throwing it out, that doesn't count towards IPCB analysis, which is fine. 
So if you look at the five meters per second wind speed, they took all the data to the left of that. And, that, and that's what they used in the sound report to say we met IPCB limits. As you can see, though, there are readings above the measured data. So while the measured data does give you a rough approximation of what you're going to see in the real world when you measure it, it certainly doesn't give you the upper limit of what you're ever going to see. OK, so moving on here, three minutes. Um, so basically, this, this, their study concluded that met it. Um, while they were, the interesting thing to me in the study is while they were doing this study, determining that they met IPCD limits, the, they were also recording, and you can see it in the, in the um, study, they recorded the logs of the citizens calling in noise complaints. So my red line there on this page shows just because you meet the IPCD doesn't mean you won't have noise complaints. So that's interesting. Now the next page here, IPCD, the first thing I did when I heard about this was I went to the IPCD webpage to see what, what is their enforcement of this. What do they do? Can't we just call them and say, go do a study on Harkey's house or whatever they need to do? It turns out, if you look at this, the red things I have underlined, OK. Um, basically, the, IP, the IPCD does nothing. Um, if you want to do a sound study yourself and present you know, a case to them, you can do that. But there's nothing they can do. So anyway, um, if, let's go back to that graph for one second here. The applicant in there, the thing that caught my eye, and the reason I made this study, and the reason I'm showing up here tonight, is the applicant basically looked at this, the same thing you're looking at, and they said, this shows that our model overestimated by two decibels. So when they did their sound study from McLean County, they chopped two decibels off every value in the 1,000 hertz range to prove that they meet the limits. Now, when you look at this, do you say that green line is overestimating everything by two decibels? So anyway, so what I did was I just I took the data that matched their stuff. Um, I plugged in. Uh, the, I took out the 2 dB um, factor reduction there, made my numbers match theirs, and then I reran some of the graphs. And what I found were a bunch of homes that are, if you take out that 2 dB, clearly over the IPCB limits. Um, the, I didn't include any participating houses from based on the data from their sound study. There is participating houses way over the sound limit. That's fine. They sign their rights away. They can do that. So my sound maps, I have one minute left. Um, the maps for each one of them is 475 square foot. I calculated the sound for every basically square nine inches, roughly. Um, so it's a little more accurate than the one point on top of each house that they gave. Seven houses had the majority of the property over the IPCB limits. Nine had about half of their property over the limits. Thirteen had illegal limits encroaching into the property, but they were corner cases, I call them. I'm not showing those in the graphs. Um, so if you look at the graphs, you can see that the, the first ones are the ones that are the property is completely covered. Um, one of the more interesting graphs that I'd like to point out here is Mr. Mr. Slagle, for the record, the red is the, anything in red is over the 41 decibels, 41.0. Yes, 41 .0. yes. And, and yellow is one below and green would be two decibels below. Um, an interesting house is on page uh, 23.509, um, which is a nice new house. I actually had to have my dad drive by and take pictures and make sure it was not an abandoned house. Um, this was not an Invenergy sound study. The house across the street from it was also not in the sound study. I didn't include a picture because uh, just the corner of it was in the red. Um, and the rest of these are basically, you see where the red is crossing into their property but not covering their house. Um, and that's basically my report. Thank you for your time and appreciate you giving me the opportunity to present this. But this one is interesting too in that um, they marked the barn instead of the house. They did that in several areas, except for the fact that um, this was the only one they did that actually showed up in the red maps. The rest were well below the limit. Questions from the board? How far up is this point uh, five one nine? The slide twenty three. You got the county road twenty five fifty east. What's the cross road? Uh, I, I I would have to actually look at the map. Um, if you look at the point five zero nine, is actually. Um, this this is about what I would say. If you go from Chanel on Route 24 and go about three, well, you know Thacker Airport, uh, about three miles west of 24 and about two mile, two or three miles south. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what do you use 1,000 versus 500? Um, the 1,000 hertz uh, was the controlling band. Like if you take away that two decibels, it's the one that runs up against. Did you do 500s as well? I did not. 
I, I could have, I could change the data and run them. Um, I didn't. Uh, in all their sound models, it was fine. Questions to staff? Would any one of the audience have questions as witness? Uh, I guess I should ask you first. Hi, uh, Jim Griffin, law firm of Shane Bank, 70 West Madison, Suite 5300, Chicago, Illinois, 60602. So, Mr. Slegel, you, you basically did your own noise study, correct? That's correct. And um, you are uh, you are not a professional acoustician, correct? That's okay. correct. And you've never worked for an acoustician, uh, acoustical engineering firm, correct? Acoustical. Yeah. Acoustical, sorry. <laughs> uh, are you a licensed engineer in the state of Illinois? No, I'm not. Uh, do you hold any professional licenses in the state of Illinois? No, I do not. Have you ever testified in a court case about noise issues? Nope. Have you ever been hired to testify in a court case about noise issues? Nope. Uh, have you been hired to testify here? No. Uh, so you've never been hired to give testimony about noise related issues? No. Have you ever performed any noise study that's been reviewed, to your knowledge, by any acoustician to confirm its accuracy? No. That's all the questions I have. Thank you. Would anyone you want to have questions? Please come forward. Any other questions? 
what the 7, the 9, and the 13 numbers were that you testified to? 7, 9, 13. Okay. Oh, the ISO. ISO, like I, ISO. No, I think it was like 7 of them were over a certain oh, sorry. Okay, 9 okay. were over a certain yeah, 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 13 yeah. were over. Yeah. Um, so basically, um, once they take out the two decibels from the 1,000 hertz range, or add them back in, depending on, it's very confusing how to say that, but um, once you take away that little fudge factor, I call it, um, seven of the homes, the majority of the property there, the first seven slides, the majority of the property is, is clearly red, meaning it's over the legal limit. Um, nine of them, if you look at the next nine in the sequence, um, you see the red and the yellow crossing over the property. So the house may or may not be in. In some of the cases, the house is in yellow and some it's in red, but the property sort of contains both the legal and an illegal area. Um, and then the other 13 homes that had a corner of the property, that basically means you got a rectangle property that just had some red coming into the corner. I didn't bother printing those out and putting those on here. But seven of them are over the legal limit per your model. Yes. And yes. did you did you like cross reference that against Invenergy's highest predicted noise levels at non participating businesses table? Yes, of course. When I first implemented the model, the first thing I did was make sure that their numbers matched mine with their two dB fudge factor. Then I took the fudge factor out and we ran the numbers. So is there a direct correlation to the seven that you say are clearly over the legal limit being the first seven ones on this list? Um, probably. They are labeled. The, the, num the houses are labeled and the numbers are at the top there. Um, well, the one that just spoke AO6 is, is the second one listed on that highest. I'm just trying to, to, to mesh in my head that they, list. They should be. Yes, they should be. Because basically, if you take the 1000 hertz column of the Invenergy's Table 3 data there and you add 2 to it, it's the exact same numbers when I'm calculating on top of the house. So the order shouldn't change. <laughs> Which I don't know. So, so you're adding two decimal points to just the 1,000 hertz or to the 500 hertz as well? Uh, no, the 5,000 hertz in Venergy actually added a decibel to it because they were saying that the model was underestimating it. Or the 500. I was the wrong way in that, but yeah, the 500 they actually added a decibel um, because it's not controlling. It's not. It's not what's controlling them. Um, so they subtracted two conveniently uh, from the 1,000 hertz. <coughs> that, that's basically in there. If you look at a slide, I think I specify where they actually make this announcement here. Um, <coughs> yes, on page 14, I just glossed over this page during the presentation. Um, but basically, um, in the application here, I could read you the paragraph if you'd like, um, or I can give you a copy of it. Basically, they said um, they've worked on a similar project, meaning the California Ridge one. Um, the uh, validation showed that the model over predicts, meaning what they did for this application, over predicts noise levels in all octave bands except 500 hertz where it under predicts by approximately one decimal. The model over predicts in the 1000 hertz oct octave band by approximately two decimal. To account for this, one decimal has been added to all predicted noise levels in the 500 hertz band, and two decibel has been subtracted from the 1000 hertz band. So that's where they say they subtracted two from everything. And, and the ISO sound study data that I ran clearly demonstrated that was the accurate. If I ran it without the two decibel subtraction, all my numbers were two decibels higher in the 1,000 hertz band. That's very concerning, but I don't think I have any other questions. Would there be any other 
questions for this witness? We only got 15 minutes left, so. <laughs> Hey, my name is Ted Hartke, H-A-R-T-K-E, 117 Southeast Avenue, Ogden, Illinois, 61859. John, um, the California Ridge and Sound Study showed raw data for my house, and it had all the octave band limits. How many houses here, can you, can you tell us how many houses here are at or worse than what my house is that I left? I could look at the tables that Invenergy gave as well as anybody else, but I don't have that handy. Uh, it would be a large number. Um, more than 20? Yeah, I think so, yeah. Less than 30? Mr. Harkey, mm -hmm. you have to limit your crossing okay. definition. <clears throat> if there were 25 family, 21 families with issues in the California Ridge project, do you expect the same number having the issue in the um, Lexington Chinella project? Again, I'm going to go with my sound. Not an expert. Mr. Okay. Mick, this is beyond what he's testified to. I don't have any more questions. Rebecca Fair, R-E-B-E-K-A-H, last name is F-E-H-R, and I'm from 8290 North 1900 East Road, Fairbury, Illinois. Mm -hmm. 8290 North, 1900 East Road, Fairbury. It was easier when we could say we're all at one. <laughs> um, I just had a quick question um, for John about the IPCB, because it's been discussed several times that if there's issues that you call, or let the Illinois Pollution Control Board know if you're having problems, and you glossed over it real fast, and I just had a question as to what happened when you called, or if you call the IPCB about any kind of issues? I remember calling them in 2015, and I actually, I do not remember the conversation. I, I, I remember the website that said, we will not investigate any situations. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Come on in. My name is Daniel Deneen, 2219 West Oakland Avenue, Bloomington, Illinois. Could you spell your last name? D E N E E N. Just one question. Mm -hmm. Does your or do the Invenergy data and your conclusions differentiate between what Invenergy calls participating and non participating homeowners and someone else called it paid versus unpaid? Yes. Um, well, why don't you review ask the question so I make sure I understand it? Okay. Uh, did the data that you reviewed differentiate between residences that were participating with Invenergy and the residences that were not participating with Invenergy? Absolutely, yes. Okay. Approximately, uh, if you have any knowledge, approximately what percentage of the residences that concerned you were not participating with Invenergy? Um, if you know. I would answer that that I don't know and that I basically made two piles of all the homes, one that are participating and signed away their rights, so frankly I didn't care what happened to them. I mean, I care what happens to them, <laughs> but as far as the date on their house, I can't argue anything with it, so I just put it in a pile. Um, I do know that, that I, I've said this, uh, 
some of the landowners are putting their money where their mouth is. I mean, there's houses that are very high sound limits on them. So, no further questions. One more time. Any other questions? Well, we're at a stopping point. We're going to continue the case. So, reconvene tomorrow night, the 24th, at 6 o'clock, and we're going to run until 10. So, that's what we're going to do. Can we talk about it? Are you done with them? Thank you. You're a great chairman, by the way. The way you run this, awesome. <laughs> Can, can we deal with some procedural issues a little bit or so I can understand? I don't know where we are on the list tomorrow. I have Dr. Schomer coming in tomorrow, uh, ready to testify. I have a CV for everybody if you wish it uh, tonight, but I'm trying, I don't want to bring an expert in that we're not going to get to tomorrow. So I don't know where my name is on the list. And I also, we still have this question about cross examination of Mr. Hankard and Mr. Parzik. Um, both of which are kind of lead items for uh, how you know how we're going to proceed.